Tens of thousands of gays and lesbians were out on the streets marching, and they're yelling that the church is the enemy, that the Bible is a book of oppression, and that Jesus is not their friend, none of which is true. If you call that winning, getting tens of thousands of gays and lesbians hating the church, condemning the Bible, acting like Jesus is their enemy, if you think that's winning, you and I are not on the same page. So we have to be very careful, even as we deal with issues, what really comes out of our actions, because the actions are often uh, resulting in unattended results. It's two really different kingdoms. Two yeah, different kingdoms. I think you're right. The kingdom of God is a different kingdom, and, and the, uh, it just, you know, if you, if you align too closely with this Babylon that we yeah. call America, you're going to uh, be aligning with the wrong kingdom. This is the kingdom of God we're a part of, and our allegiance is to the kingdom of God. Mine is. Yeah, but you're not suggesting that Christians should not be intensely involved in politics. I think that, honestly, I think preachers shouldn't be that much. I think you're right. Because uh, I think the gospel cuts the root. Uh, politics trims the bush. Politics just trims the bush. But the gospel cuts the root. If you get people to Jesus, he'll fix what's broken in you if it needs to be fixed. And just because you think it needs to be fixed doesn't necessarily mean God thinks it needs to be fixed. I say let everybody get next to Jesus and he'll fix what's broken in all of us. Well, that's but I do understand that's pie in the sky yeah, kind it really of is. thing. That's well, well what, when and I'm, what's wrong with that? Well, because when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be, be done. done where? On earth. On earth. Please understand. <clears throat> right. The kingdom but, of God. But the Republican and the de Democrats are not going to bring that about. No. But the Christians working in the Democratic Party <laughs> and in the Republican Party can move America in that direction. I think we need to be in both parties as agents of transformation, transforming those political parties Light as best salt. we can. And yeah, leaven, salt, changing, moving these parties in the direction of the will of God. Yes. That's what I would really hope the church would become. I wish the church was in every sector of society, all principalities, all powers, all dominions, all thrones. I wish we were involved in everything permeating. But the thing is, it doesn't matter if we are. Oh, because, it does. No, listen, listen, listen. We can't even get along in our churches. How are we going to get together of one mind into politics? Well, I, I mean, th think I th about it. I think it's easier... You and Jerry Falwell were both in church and you voted differently. I mean, you both loved Jesus and came to two separate conclusions on social issues, right? Yeah. So his job would be what? To influence the Republican Party in the direction of the will of God. Of his, My his, job would be to do it within the Democratic Party. Of your Party. understanding of and the will of God. We're not going to agree on everything, right. but I really do believe that God is at work through the church and its people in every sector of society. And uh, we've got to, in fact, see affirmations across the line. When, when Jerry Falwell died, they had me on CNN along with Tony Perkins of uh, the uh, uh, Family Research Council uh, to comment on him. And I think what they were expecting was that I was going to come on with gangbusters against Jerry Falwell because on so many issues we disagreed. But having said that, I had to say that a lot of his critics are going to have to face the fact that on Judgment Day, the Lord's going to say that Jerry Falwell won more people to Christ, brought them into a personal relationship with Jesus than his critics did. So that's the first thing. The second thing is Jerry Falwell did an awful lot of good. Yeah, he and, did. Uh, you know, I, you don't agree with him on but everything. Did, my point on that was that you both, I knew you both. I used to have your Christmas card and his on my refrigerator side by side. There you go. Just thinking, I know both of them. <laughs> Yeah. And the thing is, you both, I knew you, I know you both, I knew him and I know you, and you both really do love Jesus, which is very attractive to me. And yet both of you come to separate political conclusions. Not in terms of goals. If you were to say to Jerry Falwell, Tony Campolo wants to end poverty, what do you think? He would say, I want to end poverty too. Tony Campolo is opposed to, the, opposed to war. He wants to see the war in Iraq end. Jerry Falwell would say, I want to see the war in Iraq end. We could go down the list. We were both committed to the same goals. The places where we differed was the means to reach those goals. Huh. It wasn't the goals. It wasn't that he was in for one 
set of goals, and I was into an opposing set of goals. Right. We were aiming at the same goals. We just had different policies to affect the change. And, the, you know, the reality is neither of us had the whole answer. Yeah. Neither of us well, had. Well, he does now. <laughs> You're still waiting on I'll, your I'll answer. Bet he's, I'll bet he's up there fighting with Jesus. <laughs> I'll bet he's up there. But do you, do you see that difference? I mean, when I talk to my conservative friends on politics, I mean conservative politically, I don't find that they are any different than I am in terms of what they want to see this world become. The difference is, is how do we make these things happen? That's where policy differences are. And nobody's got the whole answer to that question. Well, Go ahead. all of these questions are really about the same thing, about the poor. This, this class, and that's, that's one good thing about this university and hopefully all Christian universities, is that we are understanding now that it is more about the poor than when I grew up. When I grew up, we didn't yeah. think about the poor that much because we weren't around them. We didn't, the world wasn't as small as it is now. And it was more about evangelism, winning people to Christ, and who cares if they get to eat? Even Jesus fed them before he preached to them. Consider this. Rick, Rick Warren, uh, you know, who is very, very committed now to ministering to the poor, specifically in Africa. I mean, his church is doing incredible stuff with hundreds and hundreds of teams going over and adopting villages and putting in water systems and uh, developing feeding programs in schools. Uh, he said, you know, I don't know how it happened, but I went all the way through college, Christian college, all the way through seminary, earned a doctorate in biblical studies, and never really saw all the things that the Bible says about the poor. And he says, I can't believe that, looking back on it now, because there were over 2,000 verses of Scripture that call upon us to respond to the needs of the poor. Why didn't I see it? Why didn't I see it? And I think the answer is that we all come to the Scriptures with our minds made up, and we find in the Scripture too often what we already think, rather than letting the Holy Spirit speak to us through Scripture itself. As a church, how should focusing on helping the poor be balanced with helping those in your congregation? Should one be more the focus of the church than the others? And I think that's an interesting, because I have read recently where Paul says, you know, take care of the poor and all, but especially those of the faith. He does kind of say it like, you know, if you're going to be nice to people, especially be nice to those that love Jesus, you know, I mean, but I think that, why, why, would, he, why would he differentiate? Because it seems to me like you should be nice to everybody. You should, any poor, whether they're a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Christian, a Muslim, if they're poor, they're poor. And Jesus didn't say just be nice or just be good to the Christian poor. When you read the Apostle Paul, especially when you get into Corinthians, uh, the 11th and 12th chapters, he says, the church is a body with different members having different functions. The church should be like that. I mean, you can't have a church that's where everybody's committed to the poor and nobody's committed to evangelism. Oh, you can't have a church where everybody's committed uh, to uh, uh, counseling people and nobody's taking care of evangelizing people. It seems to me that what has to happen in a church is we have to figure out what people's gifts are what people's callings are. Some people are called to be social workers. Hallelujah, amen. And we should have a ministry within the church that provides this ministry. There are other people who see themselves as evangelists, who's, who, who foam at the mouth about winning people to Christ. Uh, they should be organized to do their job. And, and there are others who would be perhaps uh, wanting to start small businesses for people who are losing their jobs. You could go on down the list. There are at least 50 different things that a church could do. And the re reaction is what? Find out who is good at what, organize them to do it, and don't ask this group to do what this group feels there to you do. Go. And don't ask this group to do what this group do, but each group affirming the other, each group recognizing we're all part of one body, and this one body has various ministries, and different people are called to different ministries.